Jose, it is great to be connected and e-meet. That's how everyone's meeting each other these days, given the pandemic. I've been following you on Twitter for quite a while, but it's great to finally chat live. Thanks for making some time. Of course, my man. I, I, now, before we get going, I still need to understand a little bit more how to pronounce your name. Is, this, is it Arjun? Because in Spanish, we wouldn't pronounce it like that. How do I pronounce your name correctly so I don't miss uh, miss out on the opportunity of embarrassing myself? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you first, how would my name be pronounced in Spanish? In Spanish, it would be Arjun or Arjun. So depending where you have like the little tilde, you see like the little check mark that you, that you have like in, in Spanish, we, we would have two different pronunciations. So I would just call, call you Arjun in Spanish or Arjun. Believe it or not, I took Spanish very briefly back in middle school and that was my Spanish name, Arjun. Yeah. However, the way my name is pronounced now, the way I like to explain it is, it's like Argentina without the Tina. Argent. Boom. I'll call you Argent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Jose, am I getting it correct too? Um, you're getting it in the American way. Like a hoe, like the, the, the thing that you use, not the other one, you know, is like the tool you <laughs> use in the, in the barn. <laughs> And, and say, but it's actually in Spanish, we just say Jose, Jose. So, Jose. Um, but I don't mind. I don't mind the, the pronunciation because I understand that there's a language barrier. And, you know, I remember reading something on Twitter of people getting offended because someone didn't know how to pronounce their name. And that's some weird thing that people should know how to pronounce your name because if not, that is some kind of cultural insensitivity. And I'm like, dude, everyone calls me Jose. I don't feel offended because that's how you would pronounce it in English. But um, people are so eager for attention that they'll just invent things to complain about on Twitter, right? Oh yeah. Um, well, look, I will say uh, Jose. I'll work on my pronunciation there. And <laughs> it, it's true. It's, it's very easy to find things to find fault in or get agitated, maybe more so than ever, especially when, you know, you can type 140 characters and reply to anyone in the world. I think we've seen yeah. <laughs> many examples of how that can lead to increased um, altercations, if we will. Incredible, man. Incredible. Well, you found me on Twitter, so I don't know if you've seen me getting in trouble on Twitter. I don't usually get in trouble on Twitter, but when I do, it's it's bad. Like, it's really bad, man. It's really bad. We can talk about that later on. Yeah. Well, look, there's a ton of stuff I would like to dive into. Um, and I know that folks out there would love to hear as well. Chances are, if I, if I have these questions, then there's many folks who would. How about to start um, in your own words? I would just love to hear a little bit about like, who you are and uh, you know, where you're from and what you would describe um, yourself as doing or what do you do? Since I was 20 something, even before I dreamed about using the internet to make an income. I spent 10 years of my life dreaming, but not taking action, <laughs> which is basically a lot of people that I know. And it's very similar to a lot of um, stories I've heard online. So it took me 10 years to make the leap to get into the online world. And here's how it happened. In 2016, I was sitting in a brand new cubicle I just got because I was I, I just recently had been, um, let's say, giving a promotion to be a marketing manager in the company that I used to work at. Um, and one random Thursday, I got an email. The email said something along the lines like, we must survive, something like that, I forgot. But I disregarded the email. It was early, early morning. I just said like, ah, I don't need that. I don't need more trouble in my life. Moments later, I, I like feel a presence near me and I like, I turn my back and I see a friend right there. And with a very, very somber face, he told me, Jose, have you read the email? I'm looking at the guy. I don't want to lie. So I just say, hmm. Then that got me curious. 
because then I started watching everyone like panicking and just pacing around and talking to themselves. I don't know, man. I clicked the email and the email said that in order for the company to survive, they would have to fire at least like 50% of the staff because the company was going through a very rough financial situation. The biggest client we had back then decided not to work with us and gave us like a month or two to, you know, <laughs> just to pack everything and leave them alone. And they were like the milking cow of the business. We had no other thing back then. So I'm like reading the email and thinking about my wife and my six month old son, Javier. And I was also worried because I had still not gotten the first paycheck of being the new marketing director. So I'm panicking. I'm like, crap, I, I don't have any savings. I don't have any other resources. I've done freelancing before. I've made money online before, but it was just serendipity. Things that fall on, on top of my lap and I just, okay, this is nice. How much? The, the client asked me, oh, this much, pay me. Pure luck. No prospecting, no nothing. Things that just happened to me. I got home that day and just slept. Like uh, I just couldn't handle the idea of being fired. Next day, it's Friday. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm right next to the human resources office. And I see every freaking person going inside, you know, in shambles, trembling and coming outside of the office with their heads down. It's the first time I've seen in like real life, men whipping and crying, realizing what just happened. I live in Dominican Republic, so watching men crying in the Dominican Republic is a big deal because it doesn't happen that often. So I'm watching all of these guys, the biggest, manliest guys crying because they will never see their friends anymore. I see people who once like shined a beautiful light with their big smiles coming outside of that office with just pure dread and pure sadness. All the colorful cubicles and all the family photos were gone because they had to pack and then go home. As I'm walking through all the cubicles, all I see is gray and some coffee stains on top of the cubicles where we once had all of those family photos where I used to just chat with my friends and, you know, walking, they're talking crap with coworkers. It's about 5 p.m. and I noticed that no one else is being called to the office. And I'm like, yes, I'm saved. Nothing will happen to me. Yes, you deserve it. You're the champ. And from the human resources department, I hear, Jose, can you come here? That's when like my heart froze. It stopped, man. I died like for a second. And I'm taking all of my time walking just slowly, as slow as I can to go to that office that was like right next to me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how can I get myself out of this trouble? And then I remember, damn, I used to work in the human resources department for one year. Maybe I'll use some manipulation and just, you know, get into her head to the human department as a, a woman that was the head of the department and get into her head and try to find a way to, I don't know, make her sad or pity me or whatever, tell her about my dad, all of the shit that was happening in my life. As I'm walking to the office, I see her face and she's like happy. And I said again, I'm safe. She's happy. And when she say, hi, Jose, I noticed her voice cracking and her eyes getting teary. That Friday in 2016, I got fired. I went home. I told my wife. She was blown back because we had a huge mortgage that we had not paid and a six month old kid. And to make matters worse, since I have gotten the race to be the head of the marketing department, my wife had decided to quit her job. <laughs> So we were both unemployed with a six month old baby, our first baby, new parents with a mortgage and with other debts, jobless. And that's when I said to myself, 
I will never work in a nine to five job anymore because that company that I used to work with prided themselves in saying that it was a people's first company, meaning us, the staff were the first thing. That day I realized that it was fake. It was not people's first. It is profit first. If it had been people's first, at least they wouldn't be preparing us and telling us what's happening throughout, you know, before all of that shit happens. So we are prepared. We start finding our jobs, which is something, for example, my mom did that when she had to downsize a company that she used to run. Not hers, but she was like the director of a non-governmental company, you know, mom profit. The money went away and she had to fire everyone. They told her, you have like six months. And during those six months, my mom did the following thing. She trained her staff on finding jobs and was preparing them for the inevitable. All of the like 20 people that work in that company, except for one, got a job before they closed the company. That is like the humane way to do it if you say people's first. And that made me realize this is all bullshit. I will never have a nine to five again. And I broke my promise. <laughs> Two years later, I, I, I couldn't handle the stress of being a freelancer and earning little bucks, you know, got a job again, developed a massive anxiety, twitch in the eye. I'm about to die. This anxiety doesn't let me sleep. I remember waking up at 3 a.m. trembling with my hands all covered in sweat, my eyes trembling. And no matter what I did, I was feeling like I was going to die. Then I changed a job to one that I actually liked. But still, I, I didn't feel like, oh, I don't want to work here, but I liked the job. Cool people, good pay, the most amount of money I had made back then. I spent two years doing the freelancing and the online business. Failed, got into a job, then got into a second job in the tech company working with bank software, okay? There, in my stay inside that job, I discovered Twitter. I had seen Twitter before, but I just thought it was a dying platform, okay? So I have never paid attention to it. And then I saw that Donald Trump was doing his stuff on Twitter. And I'm like, let me see what this crazy guy is doing. It caught my attention. I started reading about American politics and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And I started reading about why is this happening? Because I remember watching Donald Trump before all of that, you know, just calling people pigs and messing around and the weird eccentric billionaire that everyone yeah. liked in Hollywood and in New York and that crap. And I'm like, how, how is this guy, this grunt of a guy making so much gains after we just saw this charismatic guy, Obama, like all based on hope, the presidency. I wanted to understand that. And trying to understand that, I discovered people making money on Twitter. <laughs> Funny, man, because politics, money, even though they're related, they're very different, man. They're very different. Yep. I got into something we call money Twitter where people are teaching others how to make money online, how to create courses, how to sell their courses, how to create eBooks, how to freelance, how to build agencies, how to learn web design, copywriting, email marketing, SaaS, software as a service, create podcast, a beautiful community. And I said, I want this. This is what I want. I talked to my wife and she like, yeah, do it. Go ahead. I'm starting to tweet. I tweet, tweet, tweet. Nothing happens. Three months later, I quit. And I said, ah, it's too much work. Too much tweeting for nothing. But then I came back and I came back with a vengeance. I said to myself, let me start selling something. And I started selling this fancy thing you see in the uppermost part of Twitter, the Twitter header <laughs> for 30 bucks, man, 30 bucks per Twitter header. That first month selling on Twitter, I made a little bit over $4,000, not selling Twitter headers, also selling my web design skills that I have. So I sold like $500, $600 in Twitter headers and everything else was web design. By February, 2019, I was already making a great income, a solid monthly income with Twitter. And I decided to quit my job. And since then, skyrocket. I'm now one of the top creators on a platform called Gumroad, which is yep. an e-commerce platform to sell courses, eBooks, and other stuff. I'm one of the 179 creators that made over $100,000 in sales in 2020. Unfortunately, Congrats. thank you. The next bracket is a million dollars. So, you know, <laughs> I don't like telling my precise income. So I just say it's above a hundred and below a million. 
hopefully next year they have like a different bracket so I can brag without <laughs> bragging, you know? Oh, this is what Gumbro said about me, not me. Gumbro yeah. said this about me. And today I'm just focusing on coaching others on how to build their funnels, how to create a brand, a personal brand on Twitter or, or outside of Twitter. And yeah, man, just hopping into podcasts whenever I can and prospecting and finding new clients and finding new ways to increase my income every day. That is like my journey in 10 minutes. I think a little bit more than 10 minutes, but wow, that's basically it. That, oh, that's basically it. There's a ton of stuff here, which is super interesting. And I think really one of the first things you mentioned I've noticed has come up several times here, sort of in, in loops, if you will. But you said this thing, you yourself and many people are dreaming, but they're not taking action. And the interesting thing here is it, it looks like across your entire journey, you would dream, you would take action, and then you would actually maybe take a step back and you know, freelance, go back to the job, try Twitter, stop, and then come back with a vengeance. Could you talk a little bit about both of those cases? What worked the second time? What made you go back both times and go through that loop of dream, take action, dream, take action? There's something funny that happens when you start making money online. And once you like have that aha moment, when you have this, fuck, I can do it. I just learned how to do it. Once you have that, it's really hard to turn your back on that. Let me tell you how that happened. On October of 2019, I started selling the headers. That's when I discovered like I can make money online, but I don't want to make money online selling my time. I wanted to separate my time from the money making endeavor because that has been like the dream. Making money online to me is like separating my time from making money. That's how I see it in my head. For other people, it's different, okay? But that's what, like the big goal of mine. So I said to myself, okay, I can keep creating websites and I can keep creating graphic design and stuff for other people and write for other people, but that takes a lot of time. How can I separate time and making money? How can I divorce that? And I decided to write a book, an ebook, an ebook about fast skill acquisition. At first, I started writing it in Spanish because I told my wife, hey, Brenda, um, we should write a book together and we should sell it to the parents of your students. She has a music academy, so she had like 200 kids back then because, of course, throughout all of the time between like 2016 and 2018, like we still kept making money, you know, we didn't die of hunger. She was able to grow her business, but that's her story to tell, not mine. So we decided like, okay, let's write this book about fast skill acquisition and position it as a book for parents to teach their students how to enjoy learning. Mm. I told that to my wife, and, but in, inside I'm just like, I'm just a little scared bitch and I don't want to do it alone. And my wife had already published a book before about poems and stuff like that, printed a beautiful book. I, I don't know if I have it over here. Nah, I don't see it. But um, <laughs> I just said like, she knows how to do this. So let me, she's my wife. We could do something else together. Let's do it. And she was like ecstatic, happy. Yes, she loves doing stuff with me. We started writing the book in Spanish. Great. Nothing happened because we still have not launched the book. But halfway through the journey, I said to myself, hmm, I already have 4,000 followers on Twitter. Why am I not turning this into English? and launching it on my Twitter account and in my email list, which had like a hundred subscribers back then and sell it to them. But in my mind, I was like, it's in English. English is your second language. And you can listen to me right now speaking somewhat fluently. Uh, this was not like this two years ago, okay? <laughs> Especially the writing. The writing was like third grade writing. <laughs> like it was good enough. It was, you can understand it, but uh, I, I, I'm one of these guys that is just like, I criticize myself too much. I don't want to write this in English. So I decided to, oh man, I don't want to do this, but let's do it. I told my wife and she was like, actually, you know, you should have done that from the beginning. Of course, I wanted to do this with you, but I know that you can do it alone. So do it. I trust you. And of course, those words changed everything. It's amazing when you have a wife that trusts more in you than what you trust in yourself. I have that kind of relationship with my wife. She trusts me more than what I trust in myself. So it's good to have someone like that in your life. 
I wrote the book. I translated with Google Translate <laughs> everything that was in Spanish <laughs> into wow. English. And the rest, I just wrote it in English. And from time to time, I went to Google Translate to see if the English was right. <laughs> then I paid like $300 or $400 to some of my Twitter friends to spell check it. And on November 28th, 2018, I was typing an email to launch the book. But the email was too personal. It was about a time where someone I respect a lot told me, dude, some people can't learn how to code. You are one of them. I was trying to learn how to, how to code and I respect the guy. So imagine how I felt about it. I did learn how to code, but it still, you know, it pained me a lot. And I'm writing that email. I'm like, ah, I don't want to send this. It's too personal. It's too personal. Screw this. And just when I'm about to like to close the tab and I just say like, fuck this. I only have 100 subscribers. Send. That day I made $77 in sales. That's not a lot of money, but when you add up the $77 plus the encouragement from my wife, you mix it together, you have the emotional component. My wife yep. trusts in me and you have the real palpable that you can like take it out and feel the money if you from your bank account. The real thing, the money, both things together was like the catalyst that gave me all the courage and it was like rocket fuel, man. And now I'm one wow. of Gumroad's top creators, two years in a row. So that was like the breaking point when I said, this is what I want. I want to keep teaching. I want to keep showing people. I want to help others make money. I want to teach people how to do what I do. I want to keep having sales, even when I'm having a podcast, like I just had one right now. I have the computer in front of me, just talking with you. So it's beautiful when I am not working because this is for me, it's just so it's not work. I'm talking with you and still get paid. To me, that's the dream. Yep. Man. That's the dream. And that's what I teach people how to do today. Here's a very interesting thing I think you noticed. You talked about, and I think many people face this, where if someone gets that taste of, I can do this, your first sale or that, wow, I, I, people actually are interested in what I wrote or I tweeted or this book I made. If people get a taste of that, it can sort of be that initial push that breaks the inertia. Yes. However, I think you talked about, and I think many people face this. I know I face this. Have you ever heard of um, Stephen Pressfield? He, he's this author. He has this book called The War of Art, not The Art of War by Sun Tzu, which is a very popular book, but it's called The, um, the War of Art. And in that book, he talks about this concept called resistance. And resistance's best friend is rationale. And when you were telling your story here, you had every right rational reason. English is not my primary language. I've never written a book. Why does anyone want to hear about me and what I've written? All those are extremely rational reasons. You're, and you're right. You probably shouldn't have written a book in English. That's not your primary language. You Google translated it. You probably shouldn't have done that. Who writes books like that? But... You still did it. And when you did it, that $77 and that support, that was the initial kickstart. What advice do you give to people when you're coaching people now who have that resistance, that self-talk, that ah, no one cares what I'm going to do. Why should I start this? The I I've never done this before. How do you coach people through that? Because I do think like most things in life, it's a mental game. And you won that mental game there and that started. How do people overcome that? When I tell my one-on-one -on -one students, I'm very blunt as a coach because I've learned that bluntness is so scarce today in age. So it takes people aback and makes them think. No matter if they are like their gender, I'll tell them like, stop being a little bitch that quits. The worst that can happen if you launch your book is that you don't make any sales. If you don't make any sales, at least you are an author. So you won. Mm. You have multiple ways to win when you have a book. You are now an author, a zero figure author because you sold nothing, but you now have a way to call yourself an author, which helps you with authority, which gives you social proof. This is the proof. Here's my book. Feel it. Well, if you print it out, of course, and nothing happens, man. If you don't make money with that, give it away for free as a lead magnet so people subscribe to your email list or turn that into a series of blog posts or post that shit on the forums and give it away for free. This reminds me of The Martian, the book. This guy posted this for free online and it became like 
one of my favorite movies. That's yeah. one of the few books that I've read. And I remember I was in the, in the mountaintop in Jarabacoa, which is a beautiful place here in the Dominican Republic. The sun is like right next to us and it's beautiful scenery with all the mountains and all the green trees and one of the most beautiful places in the Dominican Republic. And I'm there at my wife's grandparents' house reading from a Kindle in a really humble house because they are not poor, but they live as, as if they were poor. A house with, I don't know if you know what sink is, sink plates. It's like metal, okay? Okay. And the house, instead of having a ceiling of whatever, it's metal plates. So every time it rains, it's like, <laughs> damn, it sounds really, really awful. Yeah, but I bet. Most places in the yard that have those, those stuff like that in, in, in small towns, they're just like that. So I'm inside this little townhouse pacing around reading this book on my Kindle. <laughs> Big contrast, right? And it's one of the few books that I've actually like been pacing around and I can feel my heart rate rising as I'm like, oh, this guy is about to escape. Oh, fuck, he fell into the sand. Oh, crap, the thing blew up and now he doesn't have his potatoes, everything screwed up. And he gave that shit away for free. And then Hollywood paid him, I don't know how many millions, plus the royalties of playing that online just because he gave that away for free. Reminds me yeah. of a friend of mine who I taught how to create books. She created a book for small businesses on how to use the Dominican law for their favor. Legally, of course. The most boring topic, law. She sold like 20 copies at $20. That's $400. That's like 20, 30,000 pesos, which is still a lot of money here. And she was happy. But what happens next, because she just put aside her fears, was mind-blowing. She got contacted by the biggest bank in the Dominican Republic and they approached her and told her, Hey, Carla, we want you to write some blog posts for us about law for our entrepreneurship blog. We will pay you X amount for every blog. And of course, she accepted the job. She's now teaching in universities and I believe she wow. also got other opportunities from that just because she decided to post a book about the most boring topic in the world, law. <laughs> She yeah. put away her fears and won. And she did a beautiful launch campaign. I, I was like, damn, you are a natural. Okay. And she only had like 500 followers on Instagram, all friends. And the friends bought it. <laughs> so she still made money and then made more money and got more reputation because of that book. Because she put her fears wow. to the side and just started doing the job and putting in the work. What you said there, putting fears to the side. I think eventually when anyone... Call it ship something. You're shipping a book or putting yourself out there. There is this fear. And I think the fear is what people will think, fear of it failing, fear of it not selling anything. But if I'm reading between the lines, true failure is not even trying. That's the worst I think, kind. So that's the worst kind. But what's satisfying and not trying is, oh, I didn't even try. You know, I wasn't, I didn't even put it out there. And eh, it's okay. And you can tell yourself that story. And at least in my head, I feel like I've done this before and you're somewhat deluding yourself saying, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't get rejected by anyone, but I didn't even put it out there. At the end of the it's day, though, if you it's zoom out, mechanism. it's rationale again, but yeah, I didn't put it out there. I didn't get rejected by anyone, but really I think, and I don't know if you ever feel this, something which has really worked for me is call it regret minimization. And Jeff Bezos talks about this a lot, but in those times, and it sounds like a, a tool that's worked for you and your clients is this bluntness. But for me, something which I've done, and I'm curious if this resonates with you or with other folks is, okay, if I really don't do this, fast forward 10, 20, 40 years, am I going to regret not doing it? Also, if I post this and nothing happens, who, who cares? You know, I kind of got to get over myself too. How does regret pay, play into a lot of the decisions you've made, if at all? You know, I have not regretted a lot of things before. What I regret is not actually starting sooner. <laughs> wow. That's like my biggest regret because yeah. I've based my life in a systematic approach. So instead of having goals, I've been living my life following systems. I learned this from Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. I read his acclaimed book on how to fail and still win big. Something I've like read that. the entire book, loved it. And on yeah. systems, if you like that book, Atomic Habits by James Clear is incredible too. Yeah, I have it like in the back burner somewhere. But that book, the, the Scott Adams book, took me like a couple of months to understand what he meant with systems. It's basically having good habits and finding multiple ways to win so you don't lose. Like for example, you launch a book, it flop, 
fuck, give it away for free. You didn't lose. You can give that, that away for free and you're now an author. You can say, I have a book here. Look, you won. You may not have made money, but you became a published author. Okay. In regards to what you say about the regrets and stuff like that, I read a book called Story Worthy by Matthew Dix. This is the only nonfiction book that has made me cry because of the stories that he has. They resonated a lot with me because he talks about his wife and his kids and his really crappy childhood, which is not like mine. Mine was like the best childhood, but I still live in a somewhat poor neighborhood. So I know about some of my friends that really have a tough childhood. And he calls this the 100 year rule. Every time that you're facing some challenges or some dumb thoughts or negative thought about when or why or how to do something, say to yourself, will this even matter 100 years from now? Especially powerful with negative stuff. Yeah. Like for example, my kids, they are all the time interrupting me. They open the door and that, that, that. And I'm constantly saying to myself, oh, should I like go out or will it matter that I spent an extra one, two minutes with them figuring out what they need so they become better human beings? And I've learned like not to like, hey kids, I'm working. Bye. So I try my best just to stay with them for a while. And they go away really quickly because kids don't like to be bored, of course. They just go, up, yeah. hey, dad, this, 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 and that. Look at this beautiful thing. And yesterday, my kid came with like something he made, like a mask he made. And I grabbed some rope and attached it to him. It took me like five minutes. He might not remember that in 20 years, but that stays inside his head. And when he has yep. his kids, he will learn that even if he's working, he should put the freaking rope on his kids' masks. Okay. And not this mask, not this. I'm not talking about mask. I'm talking about like superhero mask. Okay. <laughs> so I asked myself, what will matter the most? Me editing the book or me raising up strong, reliable, likable man with my kid? Of course, my kid is more important yep. than that. And I read that from Storyworthy. And I can tell you, it's, it's a good book. I learned that from him. It's something yeah. that I've been constantly like thinking, would it matter in a hundred years? And it has eased my stress more than what I actually thought it would. <laughs> so it's a good book. It's a good book. I love it. I recommend it so much. Yeah. I really like that mindset of will this matter in the long term? And I think whenever anyone can apply a longer term perspective, it just helps put things into perspective about what matters now. And I think that applies for a lot of life decisions. But I think also in work too, if, if you think from a longer term perspective, you can really think about what matters now, what are the highest impact right now, instead of getting caught up in the trivialities. I agree totally with that. Most of our fears are based in bullshit. Like really, have you ever seen fear in front of you? Like a physical form of fear? Unless you're being mugged or you have like a lion next to you, all of those fears, they just live in your head and they're not real. It's just yeah. your brain trying to keep you alive by messing with you. Okay. Yep. So something I've noticed is that once you get started with any endeavor, any goal, any habit that you want to develop, any aspiration that you want to achieve or whatever, and you get started by putting your fears to the side, you realize how dumb those fears were like instantly. It's crazy. And it always happens. Yeah. This is not something that's uncommon in the human, in the human realm. This always happens. You realize how quickly all of those fears you had were just dumb and of course, 100% irrational and yep. they have no part in your life. And yet sometimes we just let the fear beat the hell out of us. And again, if we just take a little bit of action, we notice how dumb they are. I've realized that a couple of years ago, and I've launched so many things fearing that it flops. I've sold so many things fearing that people will not like it. I've written so many blog posts, so many articles, so many emails, so many tweets fearing that someone might say, ha, huh, look at this loser, doesn't know how to write in English. And funnily enough, when I write and send those specific type of content, those are the ones that people say, damn, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a slap on the face of stop being a little bitch that quits, Jose. Keep polishing, keep posting, keep talking, keep saying, yep. stay connected with other people, keep networking, keep hopping in podcasts. 
embarrass yourself because embarrassment is the entry cost to anything, to anything, especially if you're going to be posting stuff online. Embarrassment will someday happen. You'll post some yep. dumb idea that people will say, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? And then you have the Twitter mob pursuing you with, you know, yeah, <laughs> with tiki torches and I don't know, with spikes and swords and stuff wanting to, to destroy you with their words, because that's just digital, man. Like just turn off the phone and, and nothing is happening. <laughs> well, no, that actually makes me think, I forget where I heard this, but I used to think, or I wondered, take Bruno Mars or Justin Bieber, any pop artist, why don't they just make one album with their best songs and publish that, you know, all the number one hits, why not just make those? But no one knows what the hits will be. If they did, they would just do that. So what you do is you have your hits and you have songs which tank and this goes for movies, this goes for books, this goes for anyone. And over time, I think you narrow the gap between putting something out there and knowing, you know, having taste for what works. But yeah, that's why every book you write or every piece of every tweet that goes out there, you don't know exactly what's going to work. So you have to ship the content, you have to ship the work and you acquire and develop that taste. But you got to stay in the game. You don't know what the hits will be in anything. I'll take it a little bit further. Even the flops have their fans. Mm. Even the flops have their fans. And there's a market for crappy things, man. There's a movie called, I forgot, man. If I remember, I'll refer back to it. That said, I had a book. I called it Money Mindset. It's like my worst work. I published it. I sold like 30 copies. And then I said to myself, I don't want to sell this anymore. And even though I sold like those 30 copies, I'm still getting emails from people who bought it saying like, wow. wow, this changed my life from the crappiest thing I ever launched. Of course, it's not that I make it crappy. It's that I, after I publish it, I say like, ah, this is not what I wanted. You know, regret. Take the movie The Room, for example. I don't know if you've seen it. They fall into the realm of disaster movies, which is like disaster artist. You have a failing artist that tries to make it at Hollywood and doesn't make it. This is a movie about this guy that does, tries to make it on Hollywood and fails. And it's like the worst movie ever. The dialogues are so bad. And still, The Room is like <laughs> one of those movies that, that have people that actually enjoy it because of yeah. how bad they are. It makes them laugh. It makes them cry. I don't know. And it became like a cult movie. People actually enjoy that type of crappy movie. So even though the bad things or the things that you believe are not to your standards, have their fans. And who knows, man? I rem oh, man, I remember there's this guy, Anthony Santos. He's a Dominican bachatero. He plays bachata. Bachata is like a typical Dominican rhythm. It's like Americans have rock, we have bachata, and we have merengue. Cubans have salsa, and Colombians ha have cumbia. So Anthony Santos is a bachatero. He plays bachata. And the one single that he said, I don't want to put this in my album. He put it in the last spot. That was the single that made him famous. Wow. That single, he almost didn't put it inside that CD. Oh, throw that shit in there. I need 13 songs in that CD. But I put it. That was the thing that made him famous, man. <laughs> and now he charges, I don't know, man, like 30, 40, $50,000 per just to play like a private party, some shit like that. It's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. The one thing that he said, I don't want to put inside my city was the thing that made him famous. Things happen, wow. man. Yep. You just need to throw, you just need to put your cars over the table and see if you get a full house. Who yep. knows? It might happen. And what you said there, I really like, even the flops have fans. I think that really highlights, again, if you put something out there and it wins, goes viral, fantastic, huge. That's what you wanted. You made sales. If you put something out there and it's a flop, you still have some fans. So really the only way you lose is by not putting it out there. And putting it out there could be selling something or starting an idea, or taking some action, taking really as you started, instead of just dreaming, taking some action. And I think that action can be small too. It's very easy to get caught in thinking, oh, I don't know how to code. I can't build an entire website. What about just a tweet and, hey, collect an email or a landing page? There's many things we can do to sort of break up these monumental goals and these gargantuan projects we might have into, you know, a next action. And the only way you lose again is by not taking that one step. You are 100% right.
And I'm a big fan of small actions. Recently, I hired a performance coach. I call him my nanny. <laughs> He's my nanny, my babysitter. <laughs> Even though I consider myself somewhat accomplished and with good amount of self-discipline, I still feel that I lack a little bit of focus. So I'm trying to do many things at the same time. So I hired this guy to keep me accountable. And that was like the main thing. I just want you to nanny me. You're my nanny now. And every day he's like, tell me what you've done today. Every fucking day for three months. And of course, he's now doing more than that. He helped me manage some stress and anxiety stuff that I had the other day. But he told me, look, I would like for you to go dark mode at 11 p.m. Dark mode is just turning all of the gadgets off. No screens, no nothing. It's just you, a book or a candlelight or just like no white light, no technical, no stuff, just pure you, your wife and analog things. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I started putting everything off at 11. The next day I'm like, okay, this feels good. I spent like two or three days doing that. Felt very good. Then I dropped it to 10.30. And I'm like, oh, this feels better. Then I dropped it to 10 p.m. Oh, this feels way better. And I said to myself, fuck it. Full scale, full speed ahead. 9 p.m. Dark mode. No more technology, no more Twitter, nothing after 9 p.m. And I can tell you that not only am I sleeping better, I'm also like being more productive throughout the day. And I started really small. Instead of just turning off things at 12 a.m., which is usually my go to sleep time. Instead of doing that, turning off, going to sleep, turn the stuff off at least one hour before going to sleep. And then one hour and a half, and then two hours, and then three hours. And right now, I feel like a million bucks just because of that small change that took me like yep. a, a month to implement. So it was not something from one day to another. Small steps add up really quick. Here's something I've noticed. Once it becomes easy, make it a little bit more challenging. Just do it. Let's say you are an aspiring writer and you want to write something teaching people how to code or teaching people how to write books or teaching people how to tweet or teaching people how to dominate social media or how to podcast or whatever the hell you want to teach photography, copywriting, any other skills or how to invest. Start writing 100 words every day. You can do that. It will take you like five minutes, literally like less than five minutes to write 100 words. You don't want to write it? Dictate it to Siri or open an account on otter.ai, otter with double T, that will turn your speech into text. You'll yep. get that 100 words in like 30 seconds, man. After you get comfortable with 100 words, go to 200, then 300, then 500. And then like me, just go overboard and write 10,000 words in one day. Of course, I need to be clear. I didn't write 10,000 words in one day. I dictated <laughs> 10,000 words in a couple of hours. And then I just edit it to make it sound better and look better. So that's how you do it. Small increments. It's like going to the gym. You don't lift the heaviest weight from the day one. You'll end up all sore and you cannot even move your arms yep. and your and pains in your joints. It's unbearable. Start with five pounds, then with seven, then with eight, then with 10, then 15, 20, 100, 200, 300. Who knows? Slow and steady beats going crazy. Now, all that said, from time to time, intensity is the best thing you can do. I love my daily small action things. But for example, when I'm launching something or I'm creating a new guide or a new course, I like focus on that one thing for one week, four, five, six, eight hours on that one thing, intensity for one week. Then the next three weeks is like, shit, fuck this shit. I'll just like work for two hours a day. <laughs> yep. So it's a mixture of both intensity and consistency. I like more the consistency and intensity when I need it because this drains, intensity drains. You cannot withstand eight hours of daily grinding for months. Nobody can do it. Some guys can pull it out. Some Elon Musk's of the world can pull that out. But for normal folks like me, I've realized I just can't withstand long terms of intensity. So I prefer the consistency three, four hours of work every day, real work, not bullshitting on Twitter or whatever, real work, focused work. And from time to time, eight hours every day for one week. And then forget about that for a month or two. That's one of the best strategies you can ever implement for any kind of endeavor that you want. Go crazy once a week, once a month, or once every two months, 
full speed ahead, like go overboard. Even if you don't feel like it, do it more than that. That's where growth is. When you are in the verge of your ability and you take the leap that you almost fall to the abyss, but you just don't fall to, a, to the abyss yet. But the great thing is that when you do that, the platform before the abyss grows a little bit farther, a little bit farther until you then you reach the other side. It's a beautiful analogy to, to explain this concept of daily actions and intensity. It highlights in this paradox too, I think, where tiny is easy. And tiny is safe. It's safe to dictate a couple words. It's, and it's easy to do too. You want to meditate? Okay, instead of doing 10 minutes a day, take 10 breaths. You're meditating. But I think the paradox is when an aspiring author or someone who's aspiring to get in shape hears, oh, you know, 10 push-ups a day. That's, it's trivial. It's not going to do anything. Why bother doing it? And then that's the trap again from even getting started. But Tiny is easy and tiny is safe. That one of the best ways to build a habit of going to the gym, to start, go to the gym, go in, five minutes, walk out. That's all you can do. And you're building the habit. You're taking these actions of, I am someone who goes to the gym. I am someone who exercises. And by dictating each day, you're taking these check marks down of, I am someone who writes every day or I dictate every day. So while it might feel trivial, those are the, you're proving to yourself tangibly, like I am an author, or I am a writer, or I'm a speaker, I am a, someone who lifts weights. And the only way to grow, and I like the analogy of lifting weights is, you know, you are pushing your muscles past the point and you are actually breaking yes. them down. And then they grow and come back faster and bigger and stronger. And I think that applies That's, to writing. You do a hundred, go to 500, et cetera. You know, I remember reading something on Twitter from someone I follow he is a writing coach. He teaches people how to write. And he posted something about imposter syndrome. I think I just watched this video uh, from David Perel. David Perel. And it's a short video where he tells like, when you're starting out, of course you are an imposter. Do you think that Jeff Bezos thought he was going to manage a $1 trillion valued company? Of course not. Do you think Elon Musk thought he was going to manage a company that sends rockets to Mars? Of course not. Do you think he knew how to manage a company like that? And he, he uses this example because it's true. When we are starting out, we are some, in some way uh, imposters because we're not yet in that point where we can manage that skill that we're learning or we can manage that big business that, that we dream about building or managing that huge team that we want to create one day or handle all the customers that your new SaaS company will bring once it, it, it starts you know, promoting on social media. You learn throughout the journey. Yep. And we are Absolutely. all, it's, it's really real what he says. We are imposters when we are starting out. We just learn how to become not an imposter throughout the journey. Jose now is teaching people how to make a, an income online. A couple of years ago, you had, you'd never done that before. You're an absolute imposter, absolute imposter. And on, on my side, myself, last year, did I have any idea how to set up U.S. businesses? Maybe, maybe a little bit, but absolute imposter. Now, now I feel like I know it better than most people out there, but I was absolutely an imposter. And the only way you get over that hump is you learn. And you start, you're ever, fake it till you make it. You lie to yourself and you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is the formula, man. If you don't believe in yourself, well, not believing in yourself is the most expensive thing you can ever do. Because what's the downside of believing in yourself? There's no many downsides. You might find some, but thinking that you fail, dude, that is so expensive, man. It's so expensive. It will cost you not only money, it will also cost you business, opportunities, friendships, even your family, even your family. So to people who feel that they don't believe in themselves or they feel like they are imposters or they feel like they're just faking it, screw it, man, fake it and keep pushing. One day you'll notice that all of that grunt work that you pulled off every freaking night, all of those hours of grinding and hustling and doing stuff in front of the computer or whatever your job is, all of those 
pains, all of those headaches, all of those worries, all of those nightmares that you've had thinking that nothing will work out, all of that crap will go away with only one win. That's all you need. One win changes all of that and makes all of those horrendous, painful events that you went through worth every dollar. Yeah, if only progress was linear, but unfortunately it, it isn't. If it was linear, everyone... If Let progress me tell you something linear, about that. Go ahead. <laughs> I love it that it's not linear. It's mostly exponential. I love it because even though if you're here right below, it's really hard. But once you start growing, it's like really quick. Okay? So it's a good thing that it's not linear and it looks a little bit more exponential. It looks more like a roller coaster, of course, but... It's more like that. Right now, at the moment of this writing, I have 51,400 followers on Twitter. That's 50,000 people that might one day buy something from me. That's 50,000 potential clients. That's 50,000 avenues for me to make money. It took me years to reach 50,000 followers on Twitter. And going from 400 followers when I started out, which most of them were friends, to 1,000 took me months, man months. Then from 1,000 to 4,000, like in three days, four days, something happened. Someone retweeted me and I got like 3,000 followers in a couple of days. Then from four to 10, one month. From 10 to 20, like two months. From 20 to 30, like two or three months again. And from that, that on, it's always steady growing like between 1,000 and 2,000 followers every month. Steady even if I don't tweet, <laughs> so, alone, without a lot of work. I tweet every day, five tweets, that's the minimum I tweet every day, five tweets. And it's all scheduled. I, I write it the day before or weeks before, and I just leave that uh, to be thrown to, to, the, to the wild automatically. And if I feel something that I want to say, I just hop into Twitter and say it. It's not my full-time job anymore. It used to be, but it's not anymore because I already have a big brand, a big email list, and a lot of clients that they want more from me. All because I put in the work, all of because of doing the things that I had to do even if I didn't feel like doing it. That's the trick. Sometimes you won't feel the burning desire to do something, and that's precisely the point where you have to do it, when you don't feel it, because that's how you reach the next level. Some people say that the, the eighth wonder of the world is compounding and it's the this, this secret hidden in plain sight. And I think while you are at this place where you know, it's not growing, not growing, what you're doing is planting those seeds that can then compound. And I think that that goes for many things, whether you're shipping content or tweets on Twitter or putting in the work, building a website and you're not discovering a thousand ways, the, the famous Edison quote, he didn't figure out one way to build a light bulb. He figured out a thousand ways not to, but it helps. It's that Again, reframing. You only need one win. It's one yep. win that you need. Yep, exactly. Hey, look, so I know this is awesome. There's, there's two final things I do want to ask you. If we have, do, do we have oh. a second? I ask you two final things. Shoot away, man. Okay, awesome. So the first thing is you've set up, it sounds like many different businesses and you've helped many folks set up businesses too. Could you just share a little bit about if you've set up a business in the Dominican, if you've set up one in the U.S. and what that experience has been like for you or for folks you've worked with. Any advice on that front too as well? When you're starting out, you don't technically need a business. You'll pay more taxes if you don't have the business. But what I've seen is that people overcomplicate the process of setting up a business. Oh, I don't want to hire a lawyer. I don't want to hire an accountant. I don't want to hire this. I don't want to do this. Uh, there's a, a bunch of shit that the government requires from you to set up a business. My suggestion is for people who are starting out is make your first $1,000 first. See if you like making that money like that. Scale that up to five or $10,000 a month and then open the business. That is my advice. You're not doing anything against the law because you're paying your taxes. You'll pay a little bit more taxes, but you're playing it a little bit more safe and in a systematic way. Okay? Most times people start a business and they just say, ah, this is not what I want. 
they figure things out after three months. Oh, I shouldn't have done this. So when I say startup business, it's like actually build all the legal work that requires to have an established business. That's what I'm talking about. So start with none of that crap. Nothing of that. At first, once you start seeing the money come in, hire someone to do that for you. Or you, Arjun, you do that. <laughs> Go to Arjun <laughs> and let him do that. Now I'm at the point that I want to open the business in the United States. But it took me two years and making multiple six figures to do that. Okay? So I was not in a hurry to open a business in the U.S. Now... I'm well, a, hold on. I'm Let like, me just, I think this is a great example right here where many people do think, I don't want to ship this book or anything. I need to start the business. And, oh, I need a lawyer for that. I'm just not going to do it. But actually, the advice here is figure out not only if you like making, you said, you know, hey, do you like making this 1,000 and doing this thing? But can you do it? You have to de-risk it in the first place. And yeah. then I think this highlights a great point. Launched multiple businesses, making Good money, top one seven, top one hundred gum rights. Make a lot and, of million dollars. <laughs> and what I'm hearing here is Jose still doesn't have a US business here. And that's potentially leaving money on the table. But I think this highlights a fantastic point, which is that should not be a blocker for starting and seeing Never. if you can do it and if you can Never. start to make an income online. I love that. I've tweeted this idea many times. I'm going to tell it to you right now. Things that don't matter when you are starting a business, a logo, a website, a style guide, a brand guide, a t-shirt with your logo right there in the, in the left pocket, a business card. You don't need none of that crap when you're starting a business. What you need when you're starting a business is a lot of networking, a lot of harassing people telling them, hey, buy, I have this, I can help you. A lot of sales calls, a lot of cold emails, and having at least one thing to sell. It could be a service or a product. That is what really matters. In other words, it's prospecting, networking, and closing deals on the phone or over an email. I know these people from Twitter that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, and they just recently launched their websites. They didn't need it. They just didn't need it. So that's my advice. You don't need all of that paperwork at first, okay? Once you start getting the bag, it's better to have the business because of the taxes. It's, you pay less taxes as a business that, at least that's how I understand it from the United States. You pay less taxes as a business as if you were an individual. Income tax is really high in some places in the U.S. Like California, it's like 50% of your money, something like that, I believe, in New York. So it's sometimes, so most times it's better to have the business later in the process. Of course, if you're talking about just like someone like Google, of course, they need to do the paperwork first, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about individuals that have a skill or have an idea or have a product that they want to sell, but they still have not sold it. Slowly start talking about it. Hey, buy this from me or what? It's actually the other way around. What are your needs? What are your problems? Start asking a lot, a lot of questions. Um, tell me, how do you feel uh, not being where you want to be financially, for example? Or how is your business working? Tell me what challenges are you facing? Never talk about problems. You don't want to talk about problems. You want to talk about challenges. Because a problem means that they have something that's bad in them. A challenge is something that they have to face. It's very different, different framing. So what challenges are you facing? Um, okay, what have you done? to solve those challenges. What has worked? What has not worked? Okay, how would you feel if you had someone that can help you face those challenges? Oh, that's nice, really nice. I like what, what I mean, listen. And how would you feel if you accomplished those goals that you told me about? And what are you going to do with the in extra income that you wish to, to be earning? Oh, you want to buy a beach house. Why do you want to buy that, that beach house? Oh, I want to take my family there. I want to have a great vacation with my family. Oh, you have a family? Yes, I have two kids. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I too have two kids. And you learn more about your customer like that. And then you slap them in the face with an offer telling them, okay, um, here's what we're going to do. For the next 12 weeks with my coaching, I'll show you my four pillar system that will help you systematize your business so that you can increase your income so that you can reduce all of that stress that you told me, so you can 
find a way to, you know, save up money to buy that beach house where you can go with your family there during the, your vacations. And here's how it's done. Pillar one, pillar two, pillar three, pillar four. And to join my coaching, all you have to do is it's only an investment of something. I shut my mouth and then they pay me. If they don't pay me, I start asking more, more questions until they do. So start with a customer in mind first. Ask a lot of questions. See what people are struggling with. And if you have a, a way to solve those struggles and help them face those challenges with your services, your products, your coaching, with a course, with an ebook, or whatever you the hell you can invent, talk with them and pitch them that service. Man, you can go to one of these companies that still have a fax machine and sell them something. They don't have a website? Well, let's bring you to the 21st century. Let's build you a website. Oh, the neighbor, their, their lawn has not been mowed for the last three months. <laughs> hey, guy, I can mow that for $30. And now you have your new mowing company. You start hiring people <laughs> that you find in the street and they mow the lawn for, for you. First of all, what, that scenario you just played out there, customer discovery 101, asking questions, starting with the challenges, not leading with the solution. Yeah, yeah you might have a solution, but is, does it solve that challenge? And what I love is it ties together really what you said there. In that conversation, did they ask for a business card? Did they ask for a website? Did they ask for, can I see your legal certificate of formate? No, all they want to know is, here are my challenges. Wait a second, this sounds like it solves each of those challenges. You didn't need any of those other things. And maybe after 10 of those, okay, we have a business here and let's go make this official, get the business card, set up the company, et cetera. Absolutely. People think that we're living in the 1980s or 1970s in regards to business, man. Back then, I think it was the logical thing to do. Today, one tweet can make you money. Like one fucking tweet or sending a DM to someone. It's incredibly easy. We are living in easy mode in 2021. Every time I see what I call broke Twitter, it's all a bunch of broke people tweeting from their $1,000 iPhones saying that capitalism suck and that life suck and that give me free money and that everything is unfair and nobody likes me and making money is too hard. I'm like, shut up, shut your freaking mouth. I'm here in the Dominican Republic, a place that a lot of people consider a third world country. And I have these people from all over the world paying me for my coaching even though I have a thick accent, even though I sometimes stumble trying to say something, even though I lose my train of thought at all times because I still need to think it in English. It's, it's not that natural as if I were speaking Spanish. And people pay me that money that I ask them. A good amount of money. One client is a full-time income. Just one client makes, it's like one month of income. Just one. So every time I see people complaining about how hard life is and it makes me boil, because it's the wrong mentality. To these people, I just tell them like, stop being a little bitch that quits. They get mad, like really mad if you say something like that. I don't give a shit. It's for your own benefit. I want you to win. I want you to stop complaining about shit that doesn't exist. All those fears, all those isms that people usually use, they are there. But most time it's some asshole that was having a bad day and you attribute that bad way they acted to an ism, you know, like racism, sexism, whatever ism. Most times it's nothing of that. There is a little bit of that, sometimes more than what we expect. But the reality is that some people are just having a bad day and you just accuse them of, of an ism. Forget about that shit. You're not a victim. You're living in the best moment in history of the world. Especially if you're living in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in places like more advanced places where people are eager to buy stuff online. Even here in the Dominican Republic, what some people call a shithole country. I don't. It's my house. I love it. But I do see some shitholes around like me, you know. And I see people winning and thriving regardless of their situation. I have a good friend, Aristides. He was born in a very poor, 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 poor family. So poor that his dad had to leave his house for like 10 years to travel the world uh, playing the saxophone just to pay 
the rent because musicians aren't well paid here. And that guy, even though all of those struggles, even though all of those hardships, that guy, I see this when I see him take my hat off because it's just, it's like seeing, it's like, wow. That guy went to college. He didn't graduate with uh, summa cum laude. That's like the, the honors, the most high honor in the Dominican Republic because he flunked one class, one, because he had to attend, I don't know, I think it was his sick sister and he missed that opportunity. And now he's making good money as a industrial engineer in a big factory. A guy that was born into real poverty, not American poverty where you, you're getting $3,000 a month. Real poverty, and I'm though I'm being a little bit polarizing here, but I don't give a fuck. Real poverty is what happens in my country, $200 a month. That is real poverty. And I'm, I'm mad right now because every time I see these people bitching that, oh, $3,000 is not enough. Stop fucking buying $1,000 iPhone. Stop doing that. And you'll see that you'll have the money to pay the, the whatever for your kids. My friend Aristides with a $200 a month salary came out of real horrible, horrid, soul crushing poverty. He came out of that out of pure will without asking me nor the other friends for one cent. That guy never asked us for money. Never. He never sold drugs. He never, he's like the purest guy you'll ever meet. Sweet guy, great guy. And he never asked us for money. And he came out of that horrible situation. Pure will, pure hard work. $200 a month. That's the poverty that we have in here in the Dominican Republic. And some people even less than that. Some of them have come out of poverty. It's really hard to come out of poverty in, in the Dominican Republic and in other places too. But places like this place where you have such a low salary and the government is like, you think your government is corrupt? Multiply that times 20 or 30 or 100. And that's the Dominican government. And still people find a way to get outside of that horrible $200 a month poverty. So to anyone that's struggling because they're making $3,000 a month, stop getting into debt. Stop buying shit that you don't need. If you have to move from your house to a cheaper one, do it. Do it. The big house, it feels good, but the stress of living in the big house that you owe to the bank is not worth it. It's just not worth it. Now I'm back to my normal self. I'm not mad anymore. But I do think we need more people doing what I just did. Because, of course, it sounds like I'm complaining. It is some way I'm complaining about that type of mentality. But I'm doing something about that. I'm teaching people how to not be like that. I'm showing people with my free products how to not be like that. I'm teaching people how to do that also with my paid products because I have to make money some way. But I don't mind hopping in a podcast. This is free. I don't make money from this podcast. I've never made money from any podcast. Like I don't even ask my interviewers to put like a link to my products in the descriptions because I don't give a shit. I can make my money by myself. So stop complaining, man. Like just stop complaining and put in the work and you'll see that like my friend Aristide who came out of the most horrible poverty you can ever imagine, you too can come out of any kind of situation. Thanks for sharing that This is that not story, too polarizing like, for your podcast. <laughs> no, no. I, look, I think we can all use more perspective in our lives. I, I think everyone can. I, it gets back to what you were saying earlier on will, will this matter in the future? Does this matter for me? There are plenty of folks out there who aren't as fortunate as, as really anyone, or especially, you know, if you live in the U.S. or in, in you know, these other places too. But I absolutely agree with you that in the history of humanity, there has never been a better time to be born and be alive. Never. And every day, it only improves. We have all won the, the ovarian lottery. That's what Warren Buffett says. Just being born in the first place, do you know how low the odds are? Extremely low. But being born today out of all times, we, we are all so fortunate. A little bit Internet, of perspective can go a long 24 way. 24-7 air conditioner, 24-7 lighting. Dude. I don't remember push a the button, last time I had Push a button here and have a full hot meal at your door in 20 minutes. Incredible, man. Even here in Dominican Republic, we have those things. Like one click and you have an ice cream right next to you like 30 minutes after that. I can order anything from Amazon and 
Dominicans found a way to set up a courier in Miami and fly that shit here and charge me like 200 pesos per pound. That's like $3 or $4 per pound to bring that from Miami to here. We found a way. Capitalism won. Okay. So bitching about how capitalism is, is unfair is because you hate your inability of not being able to make money. <laughs> That's what I think, man. I've tweeted about that and people, it makes people mad, but this is a reality, man. It's a reality. And unfortunately, we don't have a better system. Every other system has led to more deaths than capitalism, to more hunger than capitalism, to more horrible situations than capitalism. I might not like all the rules of capitalism, but at the moment, it's the best we have. What we have to do is find a way to make it better, to reduce poverty, to avoid redistributing wealth. I don't like that thing because it's like taking something from someone. No, it's giving more people opportunities so they can actually create their own wealth, teach people how to become wealthy, how to invest that money, how to not spend their first thousand dollars they make online in a stupid iPhone, how to be financially responsible, how to use that money in a way that produces them that more money, how to use money to even help other people make more money. That's the mission. That's how you use capitalism to make the world better. You cannot use socialism for something like that, unfortunately. You just can't because all the power is in one place, the government. Capitalism at least tries to distribute the power. Tries. It doesn't do it perfectly, but at least it tries. And now you see it. Some powerful person says some dumb shit online and people will get him fired. Capitalism won. <laughs> A hundred years ago, a powerful the guy or girl did something. Pfft, nothing happened. Now, thanks to technology and capitalism, you can get fired any dumb, creepy executive that did some bad stuff. You can get that asshole fired using what capitalism made possible. This little device on Twitter. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, man. That's why I never complain about mm. the bad parts what a, of capitalism. What a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, it's what beautiful. a time. Hey, well, look, kid you not, I could really go for another couple hours here. There's tons of other things. Even, hey, like a couple of those books you mentioned you read, I, there's so many other things. So here's what I want to do. And uh, I want to ask you a tough, I think this is a tough question, just given how many just real, real pieces of advice here. And this is what I already appreciate about you and can tell is part of your, call it vibe or part of who you are, just the candor and the bluntness. And I think I absolutely agree that is missing from, a lot of conversations today and interactions with people. The question for you, and I might be able to guess what the answer is here, but let me ask you, if you could have a billboard on the highway and everyone in the world is going to drive past this and it's a billboard on the highway, so you can't write in, um, you know, Declaration of Independent Size Font. They got to be able to read the message. What does Jose write on that billboard? Stop being a little bitch that quits. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. <laughs> if I had to guess what I was going to say, you were going to put on it. Yeah, it's, the thing is about that phrase, I stole it from a friend. His name is Ed Lattimore. I liked it so much because when I read it, it's like, yes, stop being a little bitch that quits. <laughs> he posted something along those lines. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. He's a great, great guy. Um, <laughs> Ed Lattimore is one of the reasons why I got into Twitter and posting on Twitter because the way he tweets, it's like beautiful. Man. I believe check, check he this beautiful talk, tweet. Does he talk about crackhead hustle? Is that his term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I've seen him on Twitter before. So he's a black guy who, who was born really, really poor in the in what you guys call the projects. I don't know too much about American culture, so I'm just talking out of my ass right now. But it seems that there's some kind of stereotypical thing with crack and black people. I don't quite understand it, so I don't know what I'm talking about right now. Just giving you the pre-phrase uh, so, so nobody gets offended. So Ed Lattimore, a black dude, is constantly talking about crack in a joking way. So he always talks about how crack heads work for four days without sleep to get some rock, meaning Dr. Crack. And then he says, don't let a crack head out hassle you. <laughs> it's like, it's funny when you read it, like don't get out, out hassled by a drug addict, you know? <laughs> 
But since people can see in their head like the crackhead, I believe they can imagine like, you know, Dave Chappelle had like a crackhead character back in the days. So I think people can imagine it like that. So he always uses that stereotype of that kind of people that of crack. And he's always cracking that kind of jokes. And, but the thing is that he tweeted something a long time ago in February of 2019, which it's, it's true. I, lo I love this quote. He says, pain is temporary. Being a little bitch that quits, it's forever. So that is, <laughs> <laughs> that's where I got like, stop being a little bitch that quits. Because if you do, you're going to be that little bitch that quit forever. <laughs> so that little quote, of course, it got like a thousand retweets from him. It's so powerful because it's true. Pain is short. Suffering, meaning being a little bitch, is forever. Thing is that when you are online, you can be more verbose and you can be more hyperbolic by using your words, which is more attractive. Pain is temporary. Suffering is forever. Uh, but if you say pain is temporary, being a little bitch that quits is forever. <laughs> that it's more like engaging. And that's why he has a book called Engagement is the New Cocaine. <laughs> so he, he bases his brand of, of drugs and stuff like that. And that's a way to joke about his childhood. I believe, I don't know that he uses that as a way to handle all of the things he saw as a young black man in a really poor place where he was born. That's why I think he, he does that. Some people use jokes to cope with their childhoods. I do that all the time. So I understand. I do think that's why he does it. And he doesn't do it with the desire to offend. It's just to be funny. And that guy, is, he, he, right now he has 135,000 followers on Twitter and a great reputation. And Man, he appears in James Clear's book. James Clear talks yep. about Ed Lattimore in his book. So at that level, this guy is well-respected and he came out of nothing. And with pure grit and will, he came out of poverty, make the bank, and he's now tweeting every day and living, I think, in Portugal right now, I think, living the best life he can with his girlfriend. However anyone wants to say it, don't be a bitch and quit. Don't give up. Just ship it. Just do it. I, Nike's motto, just do it. However you want to say it, I think at the end of the day, you only lose if you don't do it. You'll live with that forever, that eternal regret, etc. The flops can have fans. There's really not much downside there. You just have to get out of your head. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, when you put it that way, it's, you know, why not? Just do it. Go out. Do it. Make it happen. Just go out and do it. You know, in this conversation, is I had that realization that even the flop has fans never like thought that about that before maybe uh, before maybe behind the billboard you have two messages on one side of the billboard it's what you said before and the other side that uh, the flops have fans even the flop have fans well hey jose i had a ton of fun here honestly we might have to do this again when you know you've, you've helped hundreds of thousands of more people and your business is bigger and this was a ton of fun thank you so so much no, thank you for, for this conversation. And to finish, I liked um, it very much. where can people find you online? I guess Twitter is one that we've definitely heard, but is there anything you'd like to share with folks? Of yeah, course, what's, of the, course. How's the, what's the best place people can find you? So you can find me on my website, rosa.do, R-O-S-A dot D-O. You can find me on Twitter at Jose Rosal, J-O-S-E-R-O-S-A-D-O. And on Instagram at Jose Rosado HQ. I'm also in Clubhouse, but I don't use it. But it's also HQ. Everything is Jose Rosado HQ, except on Twitter, which is just Jose Rosado. So yeah, that's where you can find me. And anyone that's listening to me and enjoy the conversation, feel free to subscribe to my email list. I don't usually promote it that much on podcasts, but yeah, just go rosado.do slash newsletter. And you'll find a lot of free stuff and a lot of value. And I don't sell that much on, on my newsletter. So it's mostly talking about stories and how to achieve a life of freedom with those skills that you currently possess. And I also teach you some skills. So yeah, go ahead, join, and you'll love it here. Awesome. Jose, thank you so much. This is a ton of fun. Arjun, have a great day. Thank you.